total fertility uh, rate, the half year that is very, very high, so which means that they produce more uh, than other parts of the world, uh, the West, uh, uh, Asia, and the rest of them. Just by way of random example, in Niger, uh, the uh, fertility rate uh, is 7.2 uh, kids in charge, uh, 6.4. And then in the Democratic Republic of Congo is uh, 6.2. Whereas in South Korea is 1.1, Singapore 1.2, Taiwan uh, 1.2 as well. So um, the rates, the growth rates, uh, population uh, rate in Africa is astronomically higher than most um, other parts of uh, the world. Um, so, I did ask that question of, uh, well, I included it uh, in, the, in my initial um, summary, uh, whether that high population, uh, youth population, is an asset or is, is um, a liability. Uh, of course, it depends on how um, it, is, it is done. Here in the West, uh, I know that uh, very much is being done to encourage um, you know, uh, families to have uh, more children because when it is too low, it is also not um, not a good thing. But you see, uh, the West somehow uh, are looking towards Africa. I think it's it's already started uh, happening. Um, I mean, as um, as a counselor myself, I'm aware that um, uh, there is shortage of. Uh, people in the care sector um, and the the care sector itself is a very strange pyramid at this time the older people are more in number uh, whereas the, the younger ones in working population are uh, are less so what that means is that to maintain the um, uh, the services uh, of the older people and uh, people are living longer also here you need more people on, you know, the middle to the lower side of uh, the uh, population curve to be able to produce for people, uh, you know, who are older. Now, the population is not able to sustain it, and they are looking uh, outside to recruit, for example, nurses, but also the, you know, uh, broader care uh, sector. Africa is one of the places where they are looking at. So, managed well, high population should be an asset. But when mismanaged, uh, of course, uh, it can be very serious um, liability. So mismanaged youth population is a reality today, as we speak in, uh, in Africa. But that can turn around. Um, so the question is how, how, do, you, how do you turn it around? Um, I did make a categorical uh, statement uh, you know, in my introduction, which is that uh, youths are victims of failed African uh, leadership. So youths need to develop before they complete. Yeah? You need to develop people, you need to give them the tools before you can expect them uh, to lead. That tool is lacking. Usually you have that, I mean, quite apart from formal education, um, you know, uh, true example, people that you can look up to uh, as uh, as mentors, as as examples, and all of that. I'm not sure there is anybody. As a matter of fact, in Africa, when you say you you have to be careful where you uh, where you mention if you are a politician, you have to be very careful. You know the environment where you are before owning up to be a politician because that can land you into very very serious. Yes, here, politicians, uh, you know, uh, are looked up to uh, as role models. I mean, they, uh, they are not all saints, but uh, at least, uh, you know, they, they, do their, they do their best. So, um, youths in Africa lack uh, role models, um, and that is, uh, that is an issue. Um, government facilitates youth development and leadership. Uh, you, you heard the... Um, the lady uh, with uh, origin uh, in Ghana and the project she coordinates. I mean, that was that was a purposeful government that at some point thought, well, this is um, something missing in the society, and we can do something about it with, um, you know, that uh, project. That's 
what government governments do, and um, you know, uh, sort are lacking in Africa, and so um, when it is a continuous pro a recurring problem, you can understand why. Because I mean, you can't tie somebody's arms and legs, throw the person um, in the in the river, and expect the person to swim very effectively. It just doesn't work that way. Um, now, redefining African youth leadership, uh, we are currently, um, and that is something we need to accept ourselves for, you know, just give it up, uh, at a period of interregnum, end of an era, and that era, in my view, is the era of misrule, the era of bad leadership, and then the beginning of a new era of the youth taking the bulls by the horns, and saying, yes, we have the capacity, or we can still develop the capacity to uh, take leadership uh, in our hands. So that period of uh, interregnum, the end of one and the beginning of, um, of another, is where some critical thinkings have to start happening. And that brings me to uh, the relevance of um, you know, uh, a program such as uh, this one that we're having, and the choice of uh, this type of um, very dry, you know, boring uh, topic. Uh, you can see that from the number of people <laughs> leaving the uh, leaving the hall. Uh, but you know, these are very um, inconvenient conversations that uh, we have to start uh, having. Um, I mean, yesterday when I listened to people like Kizito, uh, yes, talked about you know uh, initiatives around the uh, agriculture, homegrown mm -hmm. uh, in Kenya, I believe. Uh, you you heard um, uh, Baba Tunde, you know, talk about uh, what he does here as well, and a number of others, uh, be it the solar energy uh, projects, self finance, and you know, made it very clear and proudly too that this is no charity, this is business, and the purpose of business is to make profit. He was not um, ashamed of that, and there was there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Somebody believed in their narrative put some money down, they are managing the money and they are trying to make a profit. These are all initiatives where African youths are involved in and such initiatives have multiplier effects. But then people need to realize that there is something in it for them and uh, you know, begin to um, work towards you know, setting such uh, things up. Um, one important um, case that uh, I want to bring uh, before you uh, in regards to youths, African youths, you know, taking the bulls by their arms is uh, the new voices movement. Now, uh, like I said, the, um, uh, the initi initiator of uh, the new voices movement is here with us. Uh, he's going to uh, come up here in, uh, in a few minutes and spend just um, three to five minutes uh, explaining the project uh, by himself. But before doing that, I will just read out um, a statement from the concept note of um, the New Voices uh, movement. It says, we are young millennials who are sick and tired of being sick and tired of our country being a potentially great country. So they hear it every time, oh, we have the potential to be great. Now they are tired of hearing it, they want to see it. We are also tired of waiting for some savior from some political circle to suddenly wake up and miraculously have a change of heart and start leading us right. Unlike taking laws into our own hands, we have decided to take leadership into our own hands. The New Voices Movement is a pan-Nigerian movement that seeks to raise new leaders, new faces, and new voices in our political life in the pursuit of a vision to make Nigeria the knowledge and technological capital of the world by 2050. They are even more ambitious than uh, the um, African Union that is targeting uh, 2063, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, join me in uh, welcoming Jude, the uh, initiator of uh, the New Voices Movement. Um.
Um, so I'm going to try and be brief. Uh, and I want to start from from the vision, uh, making Nigeria the knowledge and technology capital of the world. Originally, I really intend to start with that, uh, uh, but it's now that that's the background, I want to make a very simple explanation. The third industrial revolution, for example, was about machines, or or maybe even the fourth and the second was about machines. And you had the real first industrial revolution. You had the real sector and electricity. Rockefeller uh, and the Carnegie brothers basically redefining how the U.S. economy was. And then you had the second and third industrial revolution. And today we have a fourth industrial revolution, which is based on technology. But in all these industrializations, what you notice is that businesses try to do one simple thing. And I'm sure um, Vito will also understand that, business entrepreneurs will also understand that. You try to reduce the cost of production as much as possible and increase your profit. To reduce the cost of production, what do they do? They go to countries where uh, the cost of labor is very, very reduced. So you see businesses doing their research and design in the US and then shipping all their manufacturing to places like Thailand and Taiwan and China. Basically, because they want to reduce that. The same thing is going to happen for the fourth industrial revolution. Software engineers and technology engineers are, are, are going to become the labor driver. And if there's any place that we can uh, project as that frontier for the kind of development that the fourth industrial revolution uh, it's Africa. And why is that? You need young minds, creative minds, to be able to drive technology. And right now, and in the next 20 years, the only place where you will find the largest number of young minds is now. And that's why that vision is there. But I see a lot of young people like myself go into, and this is also about other young people, go into businesses, technology, are uh, uh, doing a lot of stuff like Again, Kizito is doing like Babatunde is also doing, and trying to improve the space. But we have a sort of resignation about the institutions that matter, the politics of our society, and every attempt, almost every attempt that we young people have put our energies and creativity into, has almost started with the premise that we would always have a bad government. We would always have a bad government, and we don't try to change that political space or just leave it in, a, in one corner and then deal with whatever it is that we have. But we know countries don't develop like that. We know that countries that have moved from poor countries to rich countries, for example, the Asian Tigers, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, uh, Thailand, they, they didn't shelve their politics. They basically solved the leadership problem. And that's what Raising New Voices is trying to do. As young millennials, as young people, we hear it over and over again. There's a lot of uh, uh, you can't have your iPhone if DRC doesn't exist because the main component that powers your maybe not power your iPhone, but that makes your iPhone your iPhone is in DRC. Exported in raw material all the way to China where the manufacturing is. And we have a lot of potential in Africa. It just doesn't materialize. Why? Because bad governments exist, because we have bad policies. Now, our theory of change is simple. For every African country, and starting with Nigeria, for every local government, if you have one young person who is as passionate, who is as uh, uh, competent, who is as creative as all the young people who are in the business sector, trying to solve the leadership problem in that particular small space, then we can come together as one and put all our numbers together and then tackle the number one problem that makes Africa the Africa that the rest of the world wants. And this is very, very important. And that's why the, the name of the, the movement is called the New Voices Movement. And the goal is to raise new voices, young people who are creative, who, would, who have all the competences and all the ideas and all the creativity to go into business, right? But rather channel that creativity into solving the leadership problem, which is, I think, the, the fundamental problem that Africa has. I'm going to say one thing before I sit down. 